Okay, our first speaker today is uh, Dr. Steve Korzanowski. Uh, I'm just gonna give some quick excerpts from his bio. He was employed by DuPont, DuPont Comores over 37 years. His last position was a, as a global technology man, manager in the floral technology area. He's got over 33 years of experience uh, involving fluorotelomer types of factors and products repellent coating chemistry, AFFF, and US EPA P4 2010-2015 stewardship program and fluoropolymers. He received his PhD in organic chemistry from Penn State University, co-author of numerous publications on topics including environmental uh, sources, fate and transport, toxicology, pharma pharmacokinetics, analytical methods, and AFFF fluorosurfactants. And he's currently the principal of Beach Edge Consulting with clients in fluorotechnology and other industries. Steve, welcome. I think you already did this. Um, thanks again. It's been a couple of years since I've done this one in person. We've done. We've all done a lot of things virtually, so it's good to be here today. And, and thank you very much uh, for the for the invitation. I'm going to do sort of four vignettes or or four topic areas. One is the identification and classification of PFAS. Some charts you already saw first thing this morning. I'm going to talk about some end of life projects, which is combustion and incineration. Some of the work that we and others are doing. I'm gonna spend some time on polymers of low concern, particularly fluoropolymers of low concern, which is an in-life in life measure. And then I'm gonna I'm going to talk about uses and alternatives and how you might do that. And then questions will be at, they'll be at the end. You saw this in Dr. Lohman's presentation and you keep seeing this every time you go look at classifications. You've got non-polymers on the left-hand side, the per fluoroalkyl substances and then the poly. Then you have the fluoropolymers and the per, per fluoropolyethers and side chain polymers on the right. And so this is classically how it's broken down, but it's not that simple. Uh, as you know, and as you saw this chart a few minutes ago, this has been evolving and there's really no, no set definition of, of PFAS, though the latest where anything with a CF3 or CF2 is, is classified as PFAS, but it's classified. It's structure only, nothing about hazard, nothing about toxicology, it's structure. But this has evolved from the 1,000 compounds in 2007 to the 4730 in the OECD. And then all bets were off when they said anything with a CF3 or a CF2 has, is a PFAS. And that, that could be 10, 12,000, whatever it may be. And the definition just keeps changing. And there really is no harmonized nomenclature other than the fact that if you have a CF3 or a CF2, you're called a PFAS. That's what it says. So I said from the 1,000 compounds in 2007, uh, to the 4730 in 2018, uh, each, of those, each of those studies were lists, lists of cast numbers, lists of registrations, but not necessarily items in commerce. And we're gonna talk about that in just a few minutes. And then when the EU call for evidence uh, and then the terminology paper came out in 2021, all bets were off, as I said, it, as to the number of compounds. So what we wanted to do, the first, first subject I'm gonna talk about, what we wanted to do was look at which of the items on those lists were actual commercial compounds. And I'll define that in just a second. So what we did is we published a paper, took about a year, year and a half's worth of work, publication in 2021, where we did a survey, a bottom-up survey from three of the companies in our, in our, in our, in our member group. And we looked at, at products, we looked at impurities, ingredients, metabolites, degradation, degradants, whatever it may be. And we compared that survey, that bottom-up survey, with what the OECD list said. So there's some striking things there. Number one, there aren't thousands of compounds of commercial relevance. There's hundreds, that's number one. But number two, there's been a market change, at least with our companies, in what's being used, what's being made. For example, the, the telomer side, the, the 400s, uh, we're down from about approximately 40% in the OECD paper to about 28. Ethers are up, as you've heard and talked this morning, the production of perfluoroethers ethers and various compounds are up and it's markedly up here in our member companies. And then fluoropolymers, which I'm gonna spend most of my time on today is up significantly. So I, I think, and, and if you also look at the split between non-polymers and polymers, we're about 75 non and 25% polymers. 
So this is this gives you a sense of 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 what's relevant. Now this is only three companies. Analytical keeps changing, so the numbers that we that we found are going to change as anal analytical technology gets better. But we you know we found but 256 compounds. Is it 256 or is it 270? It's somewhere in that number. It's about six percent from our three companies of what was on the OECD list. Six percent of commercial relevance. Commercial relevance, as I said, products, degradants, impurities, whatever it may be. The bottom line here is that you also heard discussion this morning around classification and grouping. And you all know the frenzy. There, there's so many of them, you can't possibly, possibly do anything else other than classify them as one or group as one. We beg to differ. And we beg to differ because the number of compounds actually is relatively small by comparison to the 10 or 12,000. What's the right answer? That's still to be determined. The fact of the matter is whether you use you know, standard composition or structure, there, there, there can be a way to do risk assessment. So that's topic number one. Topic number two, and a really important topic, and one of the last questions in the previous session is, what do you do with this stuff? And what you heard today is they sent it to an incinerator, they mixed it with fuel, and they burned it. And the question is, what did they get? How do you know? These are really important questions. So what, what's coming out of that stack? And how do you know what's happening to the neighborhoods? What do you know? We, we started a project a year and a half or so ago, focused on fluoropolymers, but looking at, looking at combustion conditions and post-combustion, not just combustion, but post-combustion conditions, because there's most of these waste energy incinerators have multiple compartments. Looking at the various conditions under, under which commercial units, waste to energy units are operating at. So how are they operating? And then what are you getting at the end? Our goal, our goal here is to, is to develop um, a, a procedure or a process that you have no, um, no, no stray emissions and you measure what they are, not easy to do. And then you, you find what the conditions are where, you, where you, don't, you don't aren't generating any fluoridated compounds. And then you look at the commercial units. We've surveyed the, the units in both the US and Europe, that's done. And so how are they operating? Are you expecting any, any emissions from those particular commercial units? So our, our project has three phases. Phase one, which is evaluating all, pri all prior studies, whether that's from the literature, theses, whatever it may be. Two, bench scale testing, actual bench scale testing. And then three, evaluate what we get versus how companies are operating versus, versus uh, what the conditions are at, at the various facilities in the US and Europe. So our goal is to evaluate the combustion conditions and the impact on formation and destruction of PICs, the products of incomplete combustion, for those four fluoropolymers. So that, that is the goal. It's not, it's not looking at, at uh, what AFFF or other products. Other, other organizations are working on those particular, we're looking at fluoropolymers. So phase one is done. We completed it last August. And this was a, a very comprehensive literature review. It looked at commercial operating conditions. It, we created a bench scale test plan. We got expert reviews from around the world. We hired experts to look at the work we were doing. We engaged with a variety of stakeholders to get critique of the work that we we're doing. And then we created a phase one report, which is the basis for, for our work. So where are we? All right, we, we thought we'd be a little further along, but, but putting together reactor design, putting together the analytical, putting together all the quality control that goes along with doing a study like this and the impact of this study and being able to, 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 to stand by the credibility of the work that we've done, it's taken a little longer, to do, but it's, it's going fine. We'll, we'll actually do our, our work third quarter, fourth quarter, we'll do, we'll do our, our bench scale testing. Uh, we're, we're in the beginning of uh, just about getting ready to do our shakedown testing. And then once we get those results and we do the comparison, then we'll decide where to go next. Cause you know, one of the questions we're gonna get is, well, why aren't you doing bench scale? Why aren't you doing pilot? Why aren't you doing full scale? So I can answer that, I can answer that later on. Third subject. Um, one of the things that, that I wanna make sure that we understand is that, is that we're talking about fluorinated polymers today. So this, this last, last segment and this one. And fluorinated polymers really are anything with a carbon fluorine either in the backbone or on the side chain. But what I'm talking about today is gonna to be on the left-hand side. I'm not talking about side chain polymers, the things that are used for repellents, textiles, carpet, whatever it may be. I'm gonna talk about fluorinated, fluorinated compounds, but I'm specifically gonna talk about 
about fluoropolymers. I'm going to talk about fluoroplastics. I'm going to talk about fluoroelastomers, and I'm going to talk about specialty fluoropolymers. So one of the things that 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 that's you've seen in the literature, you know, 2018, the Henry et al. paper came out um, around polymers of low concern. Polymers of low concern are are a set of criteria which I'll go through next, that are in life criteria. And then you're going to you're going to jump up and down and say, why aren't you looking at the life cycle? Just give me a second. Um, but these are in life in life criteria. So fluoropolymers have what they call material properties: carbon, fluorine, and the backbone. Whereas fluorotelomers, for example, have repellent properties where they have the fluorine in the side chain. They really do have little potential for human or environmental exposure because they're not soluble. They're not soluble, they're not mobile, they're not in drinking water, they're not bioaccumulative, and so on and so on. <clears throat> Punchline. So folks say, well, why are you only looking at in life? Well, we are doing research, we are doing emission reduction, and there's a variety of industry efforts that are looking at all phases of the life cycle, both the beginning of life, because there's been a, it's, it, a lot of criticism about the emissions from manufacture, and rightly so, there has been. And then end of life, which I just talked about a few minutes ago on the incineration project. But then others are going to say, well, what about landfill? What about recycling? And I'll come back to that. So the OECD criteria, there, there are 13 of them, and they've been used for a number of years, and they're, they're really grouped in a variety of different places. One is stability, which is the bottom four on the right, polymer stability and thermal and biotic and abiotic. There's the things that come out, and that's a big question. What's leaching out of your products? Fair questions. And we look at weight percent oligomer, and we look at low molecular weight leachables. And then what about size? What about particle size? Are these nanoparticles? Well, no. And then the size of the molecule itself. Is it too big to cross biological membranes? So these are the things that we use, these criteria we use to evaluate the additional fluoropolymers beyond the Henry study, which I'll talk about in just a second, just now. Now this is, again, this is a paper that was submitted for publication a month ago. It's in, it's in peer review. I was hoping to hear by, by today, of course, it's been a month whether or not we've got, we've got accepted or not, but it's, it's, still, it's still in review. But the Henry paper was done in 2018 and it looked at, at, at major fluoropolymers, PTFB being the number one. And so that blue area was the result from the Henry study. This was market, commercial market size, commercial market volume. And that paper addressed about 64% of the fluoropolymers that are well-known fluoropolymers. And so the question came, well, what about the rest of them? What about the different types? Your scope here is very limited. 64% is nice, but it's only two thirds. So what we did over the past, it's almost two, next year will be two years worth of work to get, this, to get this done is to survey our member companies and say, which fluoropolymers do you wanna put forward to go through this very intense evaluation? And so we had seven member companies between the PFP, the Performance Fluoropolymer Partnership and the Fluoropolymer Products Group out of Europe, put forth 14 additional fluoropolymers. So the four from Henry and the 14 here. So we're covering about 96% of the global fluoropolymer market. And so where we ended up, and again, this is, this is a capsule because again, it's in review and, and there's only so many things I wanna share from this. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, the fluoropolymers from what we saw from the Henry paper and elsewhere and the work that we did in this manuscript have well-developed safe, safety profiles. Um, and as I said, this did 14 additional fluoropolymers of all different kinds, the fluoropolymers, fluoroplastics, we did fluoroelastomers, and we also did specialties. So we've really rounded out the, the types and scope of fluoropolymers. And as I said a few minutes ago with the pie chart, combined with the Henry work of 2018, we're now at about 96% of the global fluoropolymer market represented here. And I'm gonna say this again, because I, I mentioned it a couple of times already, while this review focuses on in life, we spend a lot of time in the manuscript and in the supplement talking about life cycle, beginning of life and end of life, because they are very important subjects of how these chemicals are used. And we also spend a lot of time in the manuscript talking about what the polymers are used for. And I'm gonna to come to that in just a few minutes. Um, what are they used for and how valuable are they? And, uh, and again, with the properties that we talk about in the manuscript with the extensive work that we did looking at, at the different properties opposite the in-life criteria, we believe that they need to be, be, to be dealt with separately and not grouped as one um, common theme for me. Last subject. Um, uses and alternatives, because that is the subject of, of what we're talking about, that uses and alternatives. 
Um, there's lots of ways to do this. As we know, there's lots of ways to do alternative analyses. Um, one of them is from the floral, floral polymer group out of Europe, and this is taken out of their arm away that they did uh, last year. You look at technical feasibility, uh, does it work? It's pretty important, does it work? Um, economic feasibility, um, you gotta be able to afford it, but you have to look at all the other factors. Uh, availability, um, you know, when, when folks were doing the, the work at, in Washington State, for example, they were looking at, at available substitutes for paper products, are they available? So these are very important questions to ask. They might be available at some time, but are they available now if you wanna substitute? And then of course, hazards and risk. Are you regrettably substituting? The favorite, favorite two words, right? Uh, you don't wanna be doing that. Um, so there's lots of ways to do this, but this is just, this is one way that we, we've, done, we've done work here. There's lots of publications on the, in the fluoropolymer industry and elsewhere about how this work should be done. This is, one, this is sort of one way. Now. I can't show you the actual work from the manuscript. This is an abstract table with some things blinded, but this chart and the next chart are, are things that we did as part of the manuscript that we submitted. We did nine fluoropolymers, we did three floral elastomers, and we did two specialties. And what we did is we looked at the industries. Again, it's a truncated table of, of, the, of the properties. We looked at the various industries that, that the fluoropolymers are used in, and then the various end uses. And where there's dots, these are, these are major products, not necessarily in volume, but in function and use in these particular industries. And you've heard, you've heard folks like me talk about this, that these are really valuable products and you, and you sort of say, well, maybe they aren't, they are. Um, automotive, aerospace, pharmaceuticals, medical, um, semiconductors, the semiconductor industry and, and electronics and many other uses. So this is one of the things that we expand on to some great extent in the manuscript that when it, when it does come out, hopefully in the next month or so. The second thing we did is we looked at, at the properties like durability, stability, and functionality. And then, and then, the, then, and then the, the functionality, the properties and functionality like under durability, mechanical strength, wear resistance, things that you've heard about resistance to chemicals in the chemical plant, pharmaceutical plant, for example. Um, high operating temperature, you've heard fluoropolymers are relatively stable by comparison, barrier properties, uh, fuel lines. I mean, you want your, you, the auto industry is under significant pressure to keep mileage up, emissions down. Fluoropolymers used in fuel, uh, fuel lines help do that. So these are the, some of the things for the same, same nine fluoropolymers, three floral elastomers and two specialty polymers. So you're saying, well, that's one picture. What about comparisons to things that are out there that people use already? And that's fair. So one of the things that was that was done as part of the, the fluoropolymer RMOA and, and, and elsewhere, in, and which I'll talk about in just a second, is, is that there's comparisons. Why are you using a fluoropolymer? It's a PFAS, right? And you know, it doesn't go away. It's it is forever. You saw that in the in the last presentation. And it's persistent, period. Uh, but the question is. Are there things that can provide the same function so that the balance that you do as an end user, I need to use this or I don't, and what am I gonna do once I have it? Because I can't, can't readily recycle it. It's sort of a rock in a landfill, but do I wanna put it there? And incineration industry and others are still working on it. So why don't I use something that's not fluorinated? And I think that the end users have done a really good job of looking at this. And they say, well, where I can, I will, and, but some places I can't. For, for example, um, in PVC and pipes and liners, um, low resistance to chemical attack and temperature um, and lower corrosion, unsuitable for demanding applications. Um, in, in semiconductors, you all know about the semiconductor industry and the chip shortage, people want production up. So you need the cleanest, highest, cleanest rooms and the highest production capacity of, of, your, of your production, production line. Fluoropolymers allow you to do that. Very few other materials uh, allow you to do that um, because of the impurity levels or lack of impurity levels in fluoropolymers. And, and I talked about this in just a second, uh, just a few minutes ago in fuel lines and lines and gaskets, very demanding applications. There are, there are things that work. Pete, the polyether ether ketone and the polyether sulfone. Some of those products have, have good utility, but the fact is for the highest demanding applications, they don't work as well. So the end user decides, not us, even though you think I, de I don't decide. Um, and then for architects, you've seen, you've seen a lot of cases where you see the, the, architects, you, the architects, you see fabric covering domes and things like that, Denver airport, things like that. 
that's just an example. But you know, the polycarbonate sheets and others are used as membranes. They just don't work as well. They don't have the weatherability. They don't have the UV resistance. So in a lot of cases where if you're using polycarbonate, you have to cover it with a fluoropolymer. So these are just some examples. And again, there's, ex there's extensive work in the, in the fluoropolymer reference that I have here that you have in the WOVA, however you pronounce it, the WOVA app. But the other thing that was neat, a week or two ago, uh, or maybe two weeks ago, OECD came out with PCW, paints, coatings, and varnishes. And it's a pretty extensive report. So I listed, I just, I wasn't on my first set of charts, but I just, I added it just a few days ago. It gives a pretty balanced, balanced discussion about why do you use, why or why don't you, should you use four pot? They're really expensive. And so what I'm telling you is exactly what's in there too. Um, but in a lot of cases, other things don't really work. So let me finish up. Um, with the first topic, you know, this, the fluorinated products have been, have been discussed continuously, well, longer than that, but really since, since May 2000 in that time frame, 22 years. Um, but there's really no consensus definition. It's been changing. And as the definition changed, the numbers of compounds have changed. One of the things that was in the Buck paper from 2011 and the OEC terminology manuscript is they say, they say three things, be clear, specific, and descriptive. They're not all the same. Um, how many compounds in commerce? I think we had that discussion. It's, it's not 10, 12,000, it's hundreds, even if you include all the major manufacturers. So is there a way to evaluate those from a risk standpoint? And, and the answer is probably yes, and I think it has to be worked out. We're working, we and others, many others are working on thermal destruction and, and incineration. We're not, we're not alone, but we're, we may not be alone in fluoropolymers, but our focus is on destruction condition, pick formation and destruction, and mass balance, even though they say it's really hard to do or you can't do it. We wanna, we wanna look to be able to, to close mass balance in our system. Fluoropolymers, as I said earlier, have material properties. We talked about that in those two, two particular tables. Uh, in the work that Henry did and the work we have done, the data, and again, the manuscript that's coming out has an extensive supplement, about a hundred page supplement that talks about all the methods and references that we used to evaluate each of the 14 fluoropolymers for those that want all of the data, all of the data, all of the data is there. So that, that critical re review too, which will hopefully be out in a month, um, combined with the prior study shows about 18 fluoropolymers, different types, scopes, all different forms, um, cover about 96% of the global market. Then fluoropolymers really do possess a unique combination of properties and unmatched functional performance that you can't get elsewhere, but if you can, as an end user, you should. And you heard me say that, you can quote me on that because I think we're being recorded. But you know, if you don't need them, don't use them. But if you do need them, in a lot of cases you do, you should. And I have to say this, I wanna thank the folks that helped me put this together. And, and as always, these are my opinions. Um, and so I just wanna stand that for the PFP and then the companies that I consult with and thank you. It's all yours. Our next speaker is. Hang on, let me figure this out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can introduce you. As you do that. Is uh, Tiffany Scoggs from? She's the uh, director of the Office of Technical Assistance. Worked at OTA since uh, 2013. Uh, prior to being appointed as director, she served as OTA's outreach and policy analyst. And as director, she's also the executive director of the Massachusetts Toxic Use Reduction. Administrative Council, which is a policy-making body that reviews proposed regulations and chemical policies to protect the health and safety of workers and the public at large, and promotes increased coordination in the, enfor in the enforcement of toxics laws and regulations statewide. 
Um, Tiffany graduated from the, the BU School of Public Health, where she concentrated in environmental health, was awarded the William B. Patterson Memorial Award for Excellence in Environmental and Occupational Health. All, All right. right, thank you, Tim. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, so, sorry, I'm a Mac user, so <laughs> trying to figure this out is, is foreign to me, but first of all, I want to say um, congratulations to NUMOA for finally pulling this uh, in-person uh, conference off. It's been a long time planning, and I'm so happy to be here. This is the first time that I've seen um, so many public health people in, in one space in, in, in person, so it's great. So my name is Tiffany Skogstrom. I'm the director of the Massachusetts uh, um, Office of Technical Assistance, otherwise known as OTA. Um, sure. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a background on some of uh, the work that we've been doing collaborating with wastewater treatment facilities on uh, helping with PFAS source reduction. Uh, but I'm going to give you a little bit of background about uh, the Massachusetts Toxic Use Reduction Act right now. So it's a law. Um, our office was created by a law um, called the Toxic Use Reduction Act, otherwise known as, as TURA of 1989. And that requires that manufacturers, specifically manufacturers, uh, companies that make things that have uh, more than 10 employees um, in certain standard industrial classification or SIC codes uh, that manufacture greater than or equal to 20, 25,000 pounds or otherwise use uh, greater than or equal to 10,000 pounds of listed substances in the act. Um, so that's a little bit over 400 companies in Massachusetts. And if they fall under that criteria, then they have to report to the state, pay a fee, and every two years create a toxic use reduction plan to show that they're working in the best effort to reduce their use of toxics. Um, so I wanna note that TUR does not ban chemicals. It's a listing. Um, and it also just shows the effort of attempting to um, reduce the use. So the uh, TURA is implemented by three different agencies. Ours is one of them. Um, we have the Mass DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection. They're the regulatory arm. So they do the compliance, the inspections. Uh, there's our sister agency at UMass Lowell called the Toxic Use Reduction Institute uh, or TURI. And where they're based out of a university, they really do provide a lot of research assistance to businesses on safer alternatives. They have a laboratory to help companies uh, identify greener way of cleaning things. And they also supply uh, research and grants for industries, small businesses and communities on toxic use reduction. And then uh, there's us at OTA and we provide free and confidential technical assistance to help companies implement toxic use reduction efforts. Um, and so those are the three uh, three arms of uh, the TURA program. Now, we're a little bit different. Um, OTA is a non-regulatory agency. So again, I said free and confidential technical assistance. It's actually written into the statute that everything that we see is confidential. Uh, so if we see a violation, we do not report it to a, uh, you know, any sort of enforcement agency. We do our best to help with compliance assistance. Uh, and then we give concrete recommendations for toxic use reduction and resource conservation. Uh, and do a lot of uh, hand-holding through the process, working with people on um, uh, overcoming their challenging, their challenges in implementing. And we've um, conducted over 3,500 site visits and visited 1,500 facilities, reducing millions of pounds of toxic chemicals and millions of dollars and operating costs. Um, so a decision process is really needed to help keep Tara up to date. Um, and so we have several stages of decision-making that happens at Tura and uh, three different governing agencies that, uh, that make that happen. So we have the Science Advisory Board and that's managed by Turi. Um, and these scientists are appointed by the governor uh, and they do the chemical recommendations, the higher or lower hazard substances um, recommendations and that sort of thing. Then we have an advisory committee, uh, which is managed by OTA um, the appointees are uh, appointed by the Secretary of Environment, and those are, are multi-stakeholders. So we have uh, manufacturers, uh, labor, uh, occupational health, environmental health, environmental groups, um, uh, all putting their input into our policy. And then we have the Administrative Council, which is the governing board, and that's chaired by the Secretary of the Designee, which is the Undersecretary Beth Card. Um, and that's the governing body that makes the final decision on listings and that sort of thing. And I'm also the uh, executive director of the administrative council is my other role. 
Um, so how this comes um, back to PFAS is that we've had some activities under PFAS uh, recently. So the Science Advisory Board reviewed PFAS or certain PFAS uh, not otherwise listed for uh, over three years and made a recommendation to add something called PFAS not otherwise listed to the Tura chemical list. And not otherwise listed means um, that these are PFAS that are not already reported under Tura. So we actually have um, other PFAS that have been added through the toxics release inventory additions. Um, so these are, these are PFAS other than those already within Tura. Um, in August, 2021, the Administrative Council had their initial vote to add PFAS NOL to the Tura chemical list, but also add a turn substance to the definition section just for clarifying purposes, uh, we had a public comment period uh, between September 24th to October 15th, 2021. We had 100 comments um, that were submitted. 87 were in favor, 13 were opposed. And then we drafted the regulation. Um, we modified that in response to, um, to the comments and to clarify the intent. And so one of those, um, one of those changes was to add certain we added the word certain PFAS NOL to not otherwise uh, not otherwise listed to the Tura list. Um, so it didn't make the mistake of like all PFAS, just the certain ones that the Science Advisory Board was looking at. And also uh, to amend uh, the definition section to add the term substance. And that was um, voted on December 7th, 2021. Um, and then implementation began on January 1st, 2022. So the addition of certain PFAS not otherwise listed means that it applies to PFAS as short as two fully fluorinated carbons. Um, companies uh, track their use beginning January 1st, 2022. Uh, and then uh, they report their use to DEP on uh, July 1st, 2023. And also the, whole, the full definition of the certain PFAS not otherwise listed is um, in one of the handouts that I posted. Uh, that you can get on your app. Um, so let's talk about the hierarchy of controls. Um, basically, this slide provides uh, an, an example of our efforts of source reduction. If you look at the bottom, uh, you have uh, the mitigation uh, at the bottom of this period, uh, this pyramid. Um, so there's a lot of important work going on remediation and mitigation. So uh, the Tura program is working at the opposite end of the of the uh, pyramid. So we sort of turned the hierarchy of controls on its head. So we're really focused on the elimination um, when possible, uh, substitution of toxic chemicals and implementing air engineering controls. In addition, some of the TUR uh, planning processes that companies are required to do every two years can help identify administrative controls or engineering controls. And of course, PPEs, um, the, you know, the, the, the way that we protect the workers when they're when we've exhausted all other things. But basically, um, source reduction is the focus of the Tura program. And where OTA comes in is I like to think of us as the boots on the ground when it comes to PFAS. So we know that we have, you know, A triple F issues around uh, airports, fire stations, and military bases. Um, we have PFAS coming in through consumer products. We have compostable foodware that have. PFAS, and then OTA can really help with the industry uh, issues around PFAS use, and that's where we try to be proactive about. So that is our role. And to give you a little bit of public health history, um, you know, this is this is John Snow. He's the father of epidemiology, um, and so basically they had a lot of really strange ideas about where diseases came from back in 1858. You know, this is back when they were doing bloodletting, and people thought that like strange you know, strange things like temperatures and, and that sort of thing would cause disease. So there was a cholera, cholera uh, outbreak. Um, and John Snow was actually the first person to, to discover that it was actually the form of media was water that was covering, that was, um, you know, causing these, uh, these germs to spread. So today we have, instead of germs, we're thinking about chemicals. And so he engaged in boot leather epidemiology, which is really, again, the boots on the ground type of thing. So we're all familiar with contact tracing by now. Um, so this is, <laughs> this is based upon like some of the same ideas. He walked around the streets and mapped out where all of the cholera, cholera cases um, and found out that like 
hey, all of these people are getting their water from the same well. So he walked up to the Broad Street pump, took the handle off the pump, and the cholera cases dissipated. And unfortunately, it took a, <laughs> quite a while for you know, public health uh, ideas like that to catch on uh, as we, we currently uh, experience today too. Um, so luckily though, we do have a lot of companies that are, uh, have the same idea that uh, emission to remove the handle from that pump. However, there's a really a lot of obstacles for companies. So as you heard in the, um, uh, one of the first presentations today, there's really a lack of company awareness. So people could be working in the best uh, faith to try to eliminate PFAS, but if it's not on the safety data sheet or it's uh, under confidential business information or there's tainted incoming feedstock, uh, they may not, you know, they may miss a few things and that's, that's understandable. Uh, there's also regrettable substitution. So a lot of uh, substitutes don't have health data. However, as we found time and again, no health data does not mean that something is safe. And like, you'll hear talk about like the shorter chain and the longer chain PFAS. Um, shorter chain is still considered a forever chemical. There's also a fear of liability. So there could be other PFAS sources that are near uh, this particular industry, uh, such as landfills. Um, and so there's a risk of misplaced liability. And then there's, you know, lack of regulation. Although as you also heard one of the speakers uh, today, there's more and more PFAS regulations that are coming into being, um, not necessarily on the source reduction end, but as like testing of effluent and water. Um, so we started thinking about which Tura industries might be using PFAS that we could have a proactive, um, proactive conversations with uh, and engage with. So these are some of the Tura SICK codes that we identified as uh, potential PFAS users. So we have plastic materials and synthetic resins, metal coating, yeah, as you can see, these are industries that coat things. Um, and we use these SICK codes and these NIC codes as guidance uh, from EPA and other people who are working in that. And what I did was for years um, before PFAS, before we started actually like um, considering listing PFAS, I had um, interns compile these SICK and NIC codes and then um, search their online libraries, their business databases for these NAICs. Um, and so they had all of these companies that were in Massachusetts. So they started visiting the company websites. Um, and if they found two things, that if it was manufacturing in Massachusetts and that it's process in Massachusetts qualified as something as non-stick or waterproofing, then we wanted to start reaching out to them and talking with them about their PFAS use. Um, through our interactions with other agencies, we found out that you know, DEP, EPA, um, Mass Water Resource Authority also had a list of uh, high priority drinking water protection areas or, um, you know, industries that they thought might be potential PFAS. So we started compiling our lists uh, and starting, starting to ask people to refer companies to OTA so that we could start con um, offering them our free and confidential technical assistance. So the conversation would start with like, hi, can we help you with PFAS? Are you concerned about PFAS? And if they were like, no, it would still result in potentially another site visit or another toxic that they were interested in or uh, climate change and chemical safety or resource conservation. So these are all good proactive conversations that we're having with people. Um, so how this works, and we're currently working with um, three different wastewater treatment facilities and the Mass Water Resource Authority is that Mass DEP introduces OTA to the wastewater treatment facilities. We explain to the pretreatment coordinators our goal of uh, reducing toxics, which they get on board with. Uh, the wastewater treatment facility then lets the companies or the significant industrial users upstream know about OTA, say, you know, someone's going to contact you. Um, and then OTA follows up with the company. And so, um, you know, as you can imagine, it's sometimes really hard for government agencies to do cold calls to companies and be like, hi, we're from the government. We wanna help you. And they go, no, you don't, you're gonna get us in trouble. Um, so they don't always believe us. Um, so when we get a referral from another agency and we can get in the door, um, it, it sometimes help us. Um, we also have uh, referrals sometimes given to us through compliance issues. For instance, uh, DEP gives us notices non-compliance. So we follow up with those people and if, um, if it's coming from a fire department or board of health, we sometimes uh, get in the door that way. Um, but there's really a shifting regulatory lands 
landscape. Um, and there's challenges, there's challenges in PFAS generally in like understanding the different regulations on like what's coming out the effluent ends, what's coming out biosolids, and we're like source reduction can help you with all of those things. Uh, and then of course, there's a fear of liability. You're working with the government, why should they trust us? But the thing, like I said before, is the, um, once we get in the door, people see what we're doing and they want us to come back. Um, so how we help is, uh, you know, OTA goes into, the, um, goes into the facility, usually in teams of two, and we're now adapting our services to provide like virtual site visits and in-person site visits. Um, and goes in and looks at what the facility wants to look at. Um, and then within 30 days, they get a report from OTA with recommendations and then some, um, some relationship building to help them uh, act on those uh, recommendations uh, throughout however long it takes. So it's a lot of relationship building. Um, and we also have to help them understand what they're, um, what they're required to do under Tura. So as I mentioned, uh, we have other PFAS than the PFAS that were just listed. So um, tracking for the 172 PFAS that were listed underneath the uh, EPA's toxic release inventory um, began on uh, January 1st, 2021. We have certain PFAS NOL uh, that started on January 1st, 2022. Um, I want to report, so the 172 are reportable individually. Uh, the PFAS not otherwise listed are reportable as a category. In other words, they pay like one fee, they do one plan, they, um, and then um, the thresholds for TRI is 100 pounds and the reporting thresholds are uh, 25,000 uh, pounds for manufacturer to process, 10,000 pounds for otherwise listed. And then the toxics release inventory is uh, continually adding uh, other PFAS. So when those get added, the Tura Administrative Council then has to add those um, to Tura through a, a vote. And I want to point out that these slides that I posted have a typo in it under the reportable date. Um, it says, I think, January 1st, 2022 and January 1st, uh, 20, but it's July. So I tried to fix that last night, but I couldn't load it. Um, so the resources for PFAS that we're providing are um, We've borrowed heavily from the Michigan DES on their surveys, on uh, industry surveys, uh, to help businesses do an assessment of their, uh, their inventory to try to help them identify if they're using PFAS. So we have uh, currently a paper survey and metal finishing survey, and it helps OTA work with the company to flag likely sources of PFAS. And the companies can also give us their chemical abstract numbers um, so that we can, um, help them pursue research on, on products of concern. And then the companies can then also share um, that product information so that OTA can compile a list of you know, PFAS containing products versus alternatives. And we can also uh, work with other states who are doing the same thing. Uh, we also have a supplier notification letter that I put in your handouts. Um, and so that's a template that company can, companies can use to uh, tell their supplier uh, please let me know what sort of PFAS I might be receiving from you. Under the toxics release inventory, they, the supplier is um, legally obligated to disclose that information. Tara, they are legally obligated, but um, if we create enough of a, a demand, potentially people will start uh, sharing that information if companies are looking for that. But um, you know, the idea is to provide resources for companies uh, and identify some PFAS uh, product lists. So uh, once developed, the product list uh, would be available to, um, to companies to help them avoid and make uh, educated decisions on the PFAS containing products. And it also might help us identify which applications uh, might still be needed to identify alternatives. But really our goal is to prevent chemicals from reaching the community that goes for PFAS and all of the, all of the chemicals. Uh, and we really wanna assist and encourage businesses to incorporate toxics use reduction uh, to decrease chemical releases. Uh, we accept referrals uh, to toxic users from boards of health, DEP, you know, um, all of our wastewater treatment facilities. Uh, we wanna help identify uh, uses of PFAS um, and uh, also just engage with the business community and provide them with uh, an upstream effort 
uh, because it really is a joint effort. And uh, there's a lot of states also working on this that we collaborate with, that we share ideas and we bounce uh, resources off of. Um, and with that, I think I am probably out of time. So I will hand it back over to John. Okay, uh, let me introduce our, our final speaker. It's uh, Eamon Tuig. I hope I pronounced that correctly. <laughs> he joined the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation in 2012. And I got a chuckle out of this when I read it. He holds the unofficial record of serving in the greatest number of divisions over the shortest time. <laughs> so I guess there's a couple of ways you could take that. Uh, in 2017, he enlisted with the Waste Management and Prevention Division as the manager of the Residuals, Waste, and Emerging Contaminants Program. Chief among the duties of this program is ensuring that the beneficial reuse of residual materials, such as biosolids, is performed in a manner that protects the environment and human health. And a major focus of the program is to assist the state with investigations and regulatory response to PFAS contamination in our environment. Eamon has a master's degree in plant and soil science from the University of Vermont and a bachelor's degree from Vassar College. Thanks. Welcome Eamon. Thanks, John. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks everybody, good morning. Um, drove down last night from Vermont and uh, got in really late last night and ended up eating dinner at Wendy's and I feel terrible this morning. So. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to do my best, uh, and uh, I'm here to talk to you today about a small project that we undertook in Vermont. Um, we had a small grant from the EPA, a performance partnership grant, and it's a year-long uh, grant. It, it cycles every year, and it, I think about three or four months into the year, maybe five, someone said to me, hey, we got this grant. We want you to do something with it, and I said, okay, um, and so being a wastewater person, I said, well, let's let's do something we've always wanted to do, which is stop testing wastewater plants and start looking upstream to see where PFAS is coming from. Um, and I'm also gonna talk really briefly about a much larger grant, a pollution prevention grant that we have. Um, we're working with metal finishers and uh, we've talked to Tiffany several times about this work and, and learned a lot from them. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that. Um, I'm gonna because it was led by our pretreatment program and I'm not in that program, but I assisted. So um, I'm gonna focus a little bit more on our, our work um, looking specifically in sewer sheds in Vermont. So um, this brought together quite a few folks. Um, we put together a team really quickly. It included folks that are in this room. Uh, I think Steve's in the room. There he is. Uh, so Weston and Sampson was um, contracted to do the sampling and assist us with most planning. Um, we also had to partner with a couple of municipalities, as Tiffany said, recruiting, um, you know, wastewater plants can be challenging, but uh, we have a very small state and we know everybody, right? So it's like pretty easy sometimes to just pick up the phone and we're pretty lucky to have willing partners. Um, Middlebury is a, a pretty small town in Vermont, so it's Essex Junction. Uh, Essex Junction is right, right near Burlington where I live. Um, and so we've got great relationships with those operators. And we also have um, both those um, wastewater plants have biosolids programs. So 
me being a, in the biosolids program at, at DEC, there was a little extra incentive for me there to sort of try to enhance or protect the quality of those biosolids by trying to reduce PFAS in them. As we know, that's a big challenge out there for, uh, for folks managing um, these materials. We also partnered with UNH. They've been doing some really cool research on tracking PFAS in wastewater. Um, so really quickly, this team came together. Um, my colleague, Josh, is also in the back. Um, and Nick Gianetti um, was in this program, this project as well. And he's the wastewater pretreatment program coordinator. And no Vermont municipality has a pretreatment plant or program. So it's on the state and there's a staff of two now. So it's quite a big task for them. So this built on some previous work we've done. Again, Weston Sampson was involved in this project where in 2019, 2020, we took a look at uh, about 25 wastewater plants and we did influent effluent solids. Um, I'm not gonna get into that data. It's, it's, it's available on our website. Um, I think it's like ANR, if you go to agency of natural resource, uh, DEC and then backslash PFAS, but I'll, I'll have a link at the end. Um, and basically we found PFAS everywhere, right? I mean, PFAS is in wastewater. Um, the intent was to try to look at the impact of uh, wastewater treatment or landfill leachate on, on wastewater treatment facilities that accept that. Um, we, we did find higher concentrations of PFAS in those facilities that accept leachate, but we also found high concentrations in other facilities and with no, no real uh, understanding of why. Um, so, Here's a, a quick chart of some, you know, very simple bar chart. I'm gonna show a couple of these of just, these are all the wastewater plants we tested in the bottom on the x-axis there. And you'll see um, PFAS and these are the sum of our Vermont five regulated PFAS. Please don't make me go through that list, but it's PFOA, PFOS, uh, PFHXS, a few of those, a few sixes, uh, C6s. Um, and those are in nanogram per liter or part per trillion on the, on the y-axis. So, you know, I don't, I don't really know how this data compares with the rest of the country, but I think it's probably pretty low. Um, Vermont, you know, we don't have a lot of industry. There's a couple of outliers in that data that jump right at you. Mont Montpelier does take a lot of, well, they take leachate. Um, but, you know, some of these programs have uh, make biosolids. Bennington makes biosolids, Swanton makes biosolids. So, you know, we had some concerns and wanted to dig a little deeper. And um, we did test the solids at these facilities and, there's this unique trend in that we're seeing in some bio, biosolids, and I'm not going to get into the differences between what these are, but generally consider that class A is just treated for more pathogen reduction. That's just how, how you look at it. Class B uh, allows more pathogens. So why is there more uh, PFAS in class A? Not 100% sure. The research is, is ongoing. It could be that these are typically higher temperature processes. So maybe we're transforming PFAS into more measurable uh, terminal compounds. Again, we're only measuring 24, right? So we've been talking about all these numbers today. What's a, what's, what's a what? What's a PFAS? How many are there? What's in use? Um, and, and the analytical method is, is, um, is a modified drinking water method that basically still is 24 compounds, although that is going to change, I believe, this year. So to the project. Um, we partnered with these two municipalities. We sat down in their, in their uh, conference rooms, which is basically the lab at the treatment plant usually. And you know you lay out the sewer map and you go, okay, where are we going to dip our bottles? And uh, these are all grab samples because everyone says don't use a composite sampler because of the Teflon parts. I don't know if I buy that, but we didn't use them. Um, so we really wanted to look at places where we could be sure that we were sampling a representative sample of that area of the sewer shed. Right? If you're going to sample, you got to make it a representative sample. Uh, you got to know what, your, what the goal is. And the goal here for us was to really look at different sectors of the community, residential, commercial, industrial. Can we isolate those sectors through sampling? Yes, you can, right? Like a residential pump station might serve 300 homes, all residential. So it's really a great place to sample. Not only that, but you get a flow rate out of the pump so you can come up with mass. So we're not just dipping bottles and getting concentrations because that's really not great data. Concentration alone doesn't tell you very much. Because if it's a really low volume, it doesn't mean much. If it's a really low concentration and a high volume, that could be a significant source. So um, I'm not going to get into all the sites, but you could see some of the descriptions of the sites. You know, some 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 were actually direct discharges too from some industrial facilities that I will keep confidential at this point. Um, but they're personal care product manufacturers, so that was kind of interesting for us to take a look at. Uh, and we got a hospital as well, which is also kind of cool. 
Um, so here's a picture of us sampling. That's the chief operator um, pulling the manhole. And you know, in some cases, uh, we did do gravity lines. Those were really hard to estimate flow, but for the most part, we hit pump stations. So we got a pretty good idea of the flow rate. Um, these are pretty small towns, but Vermont is a pretty small state, pretty small facilities, 4.4 MGD, that's a million gallons a day. These are, in the world of wastewater, small. Um, you know, these are, this particular system is an SBR system. It's basically a batch system. All the wastewater goes into a big tank and all the processes occur in one big tank and then it goes out. Um, and that's pretty much where the wastewater industry is going as far as I can tell. Sort of the conventional lagoons and things like that are all converting over these systems. They do make a class A biosol. They do take septage. It's a classic Vermont town. Breweries, ciders, dairy. Uh, and a college, a, a very good college, Middlebury College. Um, so this is a really cool figure. I mean, I think it's cool that UNH developed for us. Um, each color on that pie represents a different PFAS that we measured. I hope you can see the key. It's a little small, I apologize for the text, but um, generally the precursors, the, the, the FTSs are in, in dark colors. And I hope you can see that. Yeah, the top is blocked out a little there, but um, the, the larger pie is the results from testing in addition to the regular analysis by modified 537, which is an isotope dilution method you subject the sample to a total oxidizing precursor or top assay. So they basically oxidize the sample and then they do the same test. So you split your sample, you, you run one the regular way and you run one after exposing it to the top assay. So basically what that does is you get to see more, right? You get to see that, that oxidizing, and I'm not a chemist, so I'm gonna stumble a little bit, but the top assay is basically transforming things to their terminal compound, right? So you're taking those precursors, those 4-2 FTSs, 6-2 FTSs, 8-2 FTSs, and you're making them, you're converting them or transforming them to the measurable compounds with the 24 we can. So the bigger pies are the ones after the top assay. Um, in some cases, and I don't know if I put it on there, some of these pies are actually much larger than we should. These are, these are to scale, I believe, but I believe in the next example, you'll note, note one has like a times five next to it. So some of these didn't even fit on the screen. Um, and I'll, I'll also show that, you know, and in the influent effluent, it's really interesting. Um, this, this doesn't really show it as well, but maybe some of the other figures will, but we noticed that by the time you get to the effluent, the top assay isn't that interesting because by the time you get through the wastewater treatment facility process, which typically involves a lot of aeration, um, and you're oxidizing things. So you don't, you might not see as big a difference between the two tests. Uh, but let's keep going because I'm I talk too much and I'm going to run out of time. Um, also, just to note that the flows, the 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 uh, the way these are linked, these pies is generally how the sewer system flows. So things are coming together and then combining and then ending up at the treatment plant at the bottom. Uh, this is the other town we worked with. That's Jim Jutris. If you're in Vermont, you know that Jim Jutris is a legend. Um, he just retired. He moved to Maine, and I I talked to him by email yesterday. He's doing great. So a little bigger town, but still small, classic, again, Vermont town. There's uh, breweries, there's a, it's actually got the most fast food chain. I'm, I'm thinking about Wendy's again. Uh, there's a Wendy's there, I believe. Um, it's like got a commercial strip, right? Which is kind of unique in Vermont. We don't have a lot of those. So um, this also, this town pulls in from two other communities. So that's why it's called a tri-town. Um, bigger facility, 6.6 .6 MGD. It's it's very traditional activated sludge uh, facility, but uh, a really cool plant. They do anaerobic digestion. They make energy, and they they can run energy neutral on certain days, which is pretty cool. Take septage. They make a class B uh, biosolid, which is land applied like four feet down the road, which is really great. I mean, for the carbon balance, it's it's liquid. It's injected. It goes. It's just a, a pretty smooth operation. The farmer is a fantastic guy. So here's what I was going to point out. See that times five there on that big one. So. This is the exact same figure from before, only you know different communities. So again, the smaller circles are going to be the regular um, isotope dilution method, and the uh, the top assay is going to be the big pie. So look at the effluents, right? So this is a, a really more of a clear picture. They're almost identical in size, those pies. So you're not seeing much, but the influent is much different. And look at that Cascade Street. That's a big pie. That would be you know as big as the screen, if not bigger. So a lot of PFAS in that residential pump station. 
Uh, this is concentration only. I should have said that earlier. And these are in uh, parts per trillion. Converted over to moles per liter, which is a, a calculation I don't even think I could do. So um, thanks to UNH for doing that for us. Uh, I think they'll be here tomorrow if anyone wants to bump into them and, and grill them. It's Dr. Paula Mauser uh, and her grad student, Sid Adams, and they're, they're fantastic. So this is another figure that um, Sid Adams put together for us. So these are the, the, all the sample locations. You've got the, the, the two towns side by side. And this is, um, again, the total of the 24 that we could measure and concentration data at the top. And then the middle one, which I would draw your attention to is mass loading. So just because you find PFAS doesn't necessarily mean there's a lot of mass there. If you look at Essex Junction, there's not a bar there really in that center graph, right? I mean, there's, there's plenty of mass at the influent, but there's, we didn't find a lot of actual mass out there in the system. Um, and so when you really put it all together and you look at the percent influent, right? So you take the mass that you measured at the influent of the wastewater plant and you compare it to the mass you found at the sample site. And then you say, okay, if this is my total coming to the plant and I sampled this guy over here, right? What's the percent? It's a very easy calculation. So pretty low, right? We didn't see, like there wasn't some big giant single discharger of PFAS, even the industrial sites, there wasn't much there. Some unique signatures, but really not a whole lot. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is an interesting project. These are Vermont towns, right? We, I wouldn't expect a ton of PFAS. We don't have a lot of industry. Um, and so I think this was a really unique exercise uh, for us to go through. Um, it's, it's a, it's, it's, these small sewer sheds where you can do this, where you can go out and you can really try to cover a large percentage of the, of the collection system and, and represent the town. It's a lot harder to do when you've got a really big town. So um, not sure if this would scale up as easily. I mean, you just need a bigger budget, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this is just a similar thing. Uh, if you notice on the bottom, Oh, this is comparing the two methods, the isotope dilution and the top assay. These are the same sample sites. I didn't throw the influent and effluent in here. And, um, you know, when you compare the two, you just see, we're able to see more mass using that top assay. So it was actually a really cool tool. I don't think that top assay is really something that you would use for regulatory purposes. This is more of an investigatory tool. Um, Let's keep going because I'm, I'm seeing I got a, just a couple minutes left. So I'll do the take homes for this, but really what one take home that, that we took away right away from this is that residential, the contribution of PFAS to the wastewater plant from residential communities was significant. I'm not saying statistically significant, but compared to the other sample sites, it was significant. So that to me tells me there's something going on and your typical consumer is using these products and releasing them and they probably don't know what they're, what they're even using and releasing. Um, the other grant that we ran uh, was this P2 grant, and I'm gonna just breeze through this really quick because it's really not my, my project. Um, but similar to what Tiffany was saying earlier is, we took a P2 grant. Vermont has historically always done the food and beverage industry, it's just that's what we do. Dairy, dairy and brewery, right? And, and we decided to shift because they opened up these other NEAs and they said, well, we were metals and aerospace industry. And this kind of light went off like, well, maybe they're looking for PFAS work. So we submitted a proposal and we got it. And they, they said, great. Uh, I was surprised we could even recruit businesses to do this work, um, but we did. Uh, some businesses really stepped up and some really cool Vermont businesses, General, uh, GE stepped up, Collins Aerospace, and they partnered with us and they said, come on in, take a look. You know, we're not pre-treat expert, pre -treat expert, pre treatment experts like Tiffany and, and those folks, but we did our best. We, we, we contracted out with some, uh, again, Wesson and Sampson's getting a big plug in this one. And, and they did all the sampling with us. Sanborn and Head is doing the technical assistance on sort of evaluating the data and looking at potential substitution products. Um, and, you know, we walked through these facilities, did the walkthrough, looked at what they do and dip bottles and check their effluent. And... Uh, I don't want to, not big spoiler alert, but we're not finding much, which is really good for Vermont, really lame for the project, but um, 
you know, that's, that's a good story for us, you know, we're, and I think the goal at this point is to expand the sampling a little bit. And we think we're going to be able to get every metal finisher in Vermont mm -hmm. under this project. So we'll really get that world. Uh, and we're also looking at the treatment plants that, that receive uh, their discharges. Um, it's just been really just a learning process for us to take all this on. Um, and it's been great to have our technical partners with us along the way, um, because they're really helping us understand this better. Um, so there's a little link to the project there. I was close, dec.vermont.gov backslash PFAS. These reports are all gonna be there. There's even a, a separate website for the, um, for the P2 grant we're running, uh, but you can go get these reports and you can dig in as deep as you'd like. Thank you. Okay, um, we got a little over 10 minutes left. We're gonna have some questions from the, uh, from the audience. I'd like the speakers, maybe if they can come up to the podium so you can use the mic. And people are gonna be asking questions. Just flag me down and I'll give you the, the mic. Hello, does this work? Yeah, it works. Okay, I was just wondering at the, the one of the slides you showed, it looked like there was um, a decrease in concentration from if influent to effluent in the wastewater treatment plant. And I was just wondering why, because you wouldn't think a wastewater treatment plant would have treatment for PFAS. So was that just because of the particle reduction or? Um, can you hear me? Do I need the mic? Uh, oh, I guess the, uh, for those out there in the world. Um, I would actually have expected a different trend. Um, typically we see PFAS go up from influent to effluent. Um, I don't know if that's universal, but that's typically what we've seen. Um, did you mean the bar chart or did you mean the? the bar chart. So, you know, and keep in mind, these are grab samples. So snapshots in time, um, I'd have to go back and look at it, but I would, I would actually say it's typically the other way. So I don't know which, which facility that was, but. Um, no, you're right. And, you know, and it certainly, I'm seeing that in a couple of these, you're right. I mean, um, it could be because it's only the Vermont five and maybe there's a difference there and, and they're changing. Um, I've thought about changing this slide to show all 24 compounds because I think it's probably a little more relevant. Yeah, yeah, the, <laughs> that's what it is. It's, but no, you're right. I mean, the treatment plants are certainly not removing these yeah. compounds. They're just, they're changing. Hi, I have a question for Tiffany. I think it's so fabulous that you have a, a separate agency, separate from the regulatory agency to help um, confidentially. And I was wondering if, if that's part of your authority to be confidential or yeah. like, you know, as opposed to, you know, public records requests, like how you keep that information confidential. Yeah, so it's actually in the Toxic Use Reduction Act statute that our services are confidential. Um, so the only time that it can be disclosed is if a company agrees that they want to work side by side with a regulatory agency. For instance, if they get like a notice of non-compliance or their board of health has contacted us, they might say, yes, please show that we're working with you. Otherwise um, we cannot disclose who, um, you know, who we're working with uh, on the company end, they can disclose. Uh, but under the statute, everything is confidential that we work with companies unless they've waived the confidentiality. Hi, um, yeah, I had a question for Tiffany as well. I was just wondering for um, how TORA would overlap with TOSCA when listing and regulating PFAS compounds. Um, so they're, they're, they're different. <laughs> so, so TORA is uh, a state you know, regulation where they have to plan um, detox use reduction plans for chemicals that are listed. Um, so there's there's really not much overlap and they're like, they're actually, Terry might be a better, I, I don't know if Liz, you wanna add anything about the difference between Tosca and 
and Tara. Um, come back. Yeah, they are very different. Um, I, I can't speak piece for piece about how different they are. <laughs> but so just add that uh, we've been disappointed at how little information we can get out of Tosca, which should be the source of, of states, you know, information about uh, what manufacturers are using and, and reporting. And it's been uh, very challenging. Tiffany's uh, tried hard, but it's been really challenging to get that. So, Thank you. I appreciate I'm, that. I appreciate the group effort. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to sneak in with my question now. So Steve, um, you mentioned the breakdown of uh, by percentage of like the number of different chemicals in each of those uh, different categories, like the ethers and the telomeres and stuff. Do you can you give the same kind of information for like overall quantity used in those different categories? No, no. You know, you you already knew the answer to that. <laughs> not not even yeah. aggregated this the same the same struggle that you have getting companies to give you a tonnage we, we listen we, we're dealing with 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 uh, global companies and you they don't share production lines we don't we don't know that they are i mean you can there are various studies out there that that you can get information and that's that's how like that's how i, cre I created the created the pie with 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 mark but companies themselves don't them yeah. oh i did try but it, 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 they told me no, and no, and un, un, in no uncertain terms. Thank you. You ask that every time, though. It's been a year. Yeah. And it, it has, it, it hasn't changed. Uh, this question is for uh, Eamon. I was wondering um, which uh, analysis techniques you used for your samples, uh, and when you sent it to a lab, was it a certified lab, or how did you find your labs and and choose your analysis techniques, and also um, the kind of training people needed for the sampling that you took from the wastewater. Oh, good question. Yeah. So the um, the method that we use, which is not a standardized method, but it's the modified drinking water method. So it's modified five thirty seven. Um, and how do we choose a lab? Well, we choose the the contractor um, to do the sampling, and they have the contract with the lab. So um, I believe that was Alpha Analytical, um, which is kind of local. Um, and they do a lot of PFAS analysis. Uh, it's definitely for DEC, for Vermont DEC. Um, the training, um, not much, uh, honestly. Like we, you know, we, um, we, the contractor should answer that question. He's in the back of the room. They develop a, a, a quality assurance plan, a QAP and a health and safety plan, a HASP, which we review fairly. And, um, you know, we, we go to the field and we do it together usually once as a group and we talk about it and then we turn them loose and they go and do their stuff. Um, you know, we're not sampling drinking water in these projects. It's wastewater. We know there's plenty of PFAS in there. Um, so we do some, you know, there's, there's blanks quality control by the lab. Um, but we're not too, I wasn't too concerned about like, you know, my skincare product contaminating the sample. I mean, if I was sampling drinking water, I would be. I would. We would be a, probably a little more vigilant with that. But I mean, if Steve, if you want to chime in, please do. Don't. If you're still here. Oh, right. conveniently he left. <laughs> Perfect timing. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's maybe he's just ducking down back there, and we can't see him. But, um, but no, that's a good question, and and uh, certainly I think um, Anthony will be talking later today um, from New Hampshire DES about probably a similar project they did, and I think he could speak to that as well. And I think they use different sampling equipment and things like that. We just got the bottles from the lab and and dipped them on a pole, right? Okay. So yeah. Uh, I just. Um... I wanted to just go back to the Tosca question again, like it just occurred, I should have stated that the um, Terra list is based upon CERCLA and, and EPRA. So there's more of like a, a relationship with that than, than Tosca. I just thought I'd mention that. Too. 